Why don't we look to the Lord for a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you so much for your grace and for a revelation that you have given us of your son that um, in your providence, it meets the desires of our heart. To be honest, sometimes, Lord, we mimic the behavior of, of, of children in the sense that we sometimes are oblivious to the broader dimensions of what's going on around us. And when it comes to spiritual things, how you work and the way in which you use the events of a day, they can be kind of confusing. They can leave us perhaps even drawing some erroneous conclusions. But when our eyes are open and uh, we see, Lord, something of your, of your wisdom and your providence working itself out in time, it has a way of producing in us a, a level of maturity that produces a steadfastness and a boldness to live our lives in a way that glorifies you and enjoys you. I pray, Lord, that that's what would take place here. I pray that our time together, as we sing these truths, as we encourage one another by our presence, as we lock arms and begin to um, demonstrate something of the, the power of the body of Christ, we would also be more and more conformed into your image. And we'll be careful, Lord, to give you all the praise in Christ's name as we see this being done. For we pray it in his name, amen. You know, every Sunday morning, um, especially on those days that my, uh, my wife, who's a nurse, she, uh, she has to be there somewhere around 6.30 in the morning. So when she gets up early, our radio is tuned in to Paul Parent on Sunday morning. Now, for those of you who don't know, Paul Parent has this uh, gardening uh, radio program, and he gives you all kinds of tips on how to better, you know, do this work around your yard. Well, I'll tell you, Paul Parent has taught me a bunch about how to get rid of weeds, how to get rid of voles, how to get fungus out of trees. I mean, the guy is amazing. He's just in this like really kind of easy, main kind of way, just like kind of walks you through stuff. I mean, he schooled me on how to water, when to put down lime, how to, how to prune. I mean, I had no idea how much work it takes to make your garden so as good as it does. But um, I remember this one day after hearing Paul provide some pruning directions on how to, how to prune up an azalea bush, I was feeling particularly motivated. And translated, that means I didn't ask my wife's permission. <laughs> All right? So in my motivation, I go out there and we had these two big azalea bushes in front of the house. Let me just say, by the time I finished with those bushes, they were looking fit and trim, baby. They were looking awesome. And when my wife came home, the look on her face, well, let's just say it was a little short of being pleased. I mean, it's amazing how she's got this look like perfected because it took me back to the days when the boys were small and I used to give them a haircut and I would get that same look like, are you kidding me? You know, that kind of look. But as the season progressed, man, and that azalea bush started putting out its blooms, let's just say I knew what I was doing. It was awesome, man. Those flowers, I mean, I just, you know, I could just grow things now. You know what I'm saying? But the more time I spend in ministry, uh, that's another story, man. You, you need a whole bunch more wisdom on how to make things grow spiritually. I have found that looking at a passage in John chapter 15, it is this one passage that's just filled with, with this kind of wisdom and discernment that we could use to make sure that our lives are really producing the kind of fruit that gives God honor and glory. I found that John 15 is a great source for this wisdom and it gives us some insight on how to become even more fruitful. 
In this passage, Jesus uses the uh, metaphor of a vine and branches and the fruit that it produces. And, um, and yet, I just want to state at the outset that this passage has, is not just about how to become more fruitful in your spiritual life. There's something much, much deeper than that. And it's not like wearing a Dakota ring and you're going to, only the privileged few can figure it out. I think the passage is saying that. It's just that we have to really understand it in all of its context. So to do that, in, in John 15, if you pull out your notes, you'll, you'll see that it begins with an I am statement. Jesus is here and um, he's making another one of those um, statements that are declaring to us that he is self-consciously aware that he is God. It's not like he's waiting somebody for somebody else to tell him. Jesus is aware of the role that he is playing. That's why, as if you've been, uh, you know, uh, here for Sundays, as we've been going through this series, Crossing the Line, you are aware that we've been looking at passages, for instance, like, um, you know, I am the bread of life. Jesus feeds 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. And then he says, but here's the real secret. You have to feed on me. I am the staple for this life. Or you look at Jesus when he says, I am the light of the world. He heals a man born blind, and then he looks at the people and he says, if any man believes in me, he will not walk in darkness because I am the light of the world. Or in John 11, when he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the, the, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. See, Jesus is entering into that kind of consciousness and is saying to the crowd, I am the true vine. So what is he saying there? Well, the vine imagery is often used in the Old Testament as a way to describe um, the nation of Israel. It had become a metaphor for the way in which God referred to the nation of Israel as calling them this fruitful vine. They were God's covenant people. Now, this is a really important thing for you to understand. So what I've done is I've just taken out one passage. It's in Psalm 80, and I'm gonna put it up on the screen here in a moment. But there are others in the Bible that you could find. Isaiah chapter five, for those of you who are note takers, you can put that on the side, Isaiah five. Read through that and you'll see this great description of Israel as being this vine. But here in Psalm 80, let's get to the heart of what I really wanna to talk to you about here. It's, the psalmist says this, he says, you brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its bows to the sea, its shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and the creatures of the, feed, of the field feed on it. Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down. It's burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. The psalmist understood that God was responsible for this vine. He's the one that carried it as his tender shoot out of its bondage when it was in, Is when it was in Egypt. And through Moses led them out through this wilderness and replanted them again that they might be more fruitful. Do you notice how in this text it refers to the vine as the son that you have planted for yourself? This vine now is representative of a relationship that they have with God. God gave them birth. He, he born them. And now he says, you're the son of my right hand. But somehow or another the vine now has has ceased to be everything that God had created it to be. So the vine now 
failed to fulfill its purpose and therefore provoked divine judgment. That's why when you take note that in John 15, 1, Jesus then is making a very bold statement. The vine that was the son of God, his right hand, now is saying, Je Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. I am that son that was at the right hand of the father. I am the true vine that gathers its life from the father and as a result produces his fruit. And he will go on to tell us that the true vine is not the rebellious nation of Israel, but Jesus himself. That's why this is much deeper than just, hey, let's talk about how we could become more spiritually fruitful. At the bottom line, what is being declared by Jesus is, I am that vine that God planted and those who are in him, it says, th those who wish to be a part of the true vine need to be light, rightly related to, to Jesus. And so he uses this metaphor, the metaphor of a branch and the vine. And so the question for us today is really this, it's how are we to manifest this union then with Jesus? Jesus is gonna talk about the vine and branches and fruit, and he does so, but it's all in the context about this union that we are supposed to be having with the true vine. So along that discussion then, I want you to turn in your sermon notes and look at John chapter five, and let's, let's uh, read verse, the first four verses. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You already are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can the, you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now Jesus is giving us some just simple instruction about the dynamics that take place between a vine and a branch. And so I just wanna underscore the point that he's making here in these first four verses. What he's saying to you and me is that the branch derives its life from the vine. That's why he says, look, you can't, you can't bear fruit unless you remain in me. You know, uh, no branch can do it by itself. The, the vine, the, the life of the branch is derived from the vine. So now we're introduced to the father. He's the, he's the master gardener. And now we see that the, 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 the father is going to get engaged in this pruning process. And the first order of business is that you have to survive the father's cut. Because the task of the father here is to cut and to prune. And he does so by distinguishing between those branches that are bearing fruit and those non-bearing fruit. Those who are productive and those who are unproductive. That's the first order of business. I used to pastor a church in Oregon. And um, when I first arrived in Oregon, there was a woman in our con, uh, well, in Oregon, if you don't, Portland is known as the city of roses. And um, there is the, um, the, 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 the Rose City, it's a beautiful garden in downtown uh, Portland. And this is just a small segment of it. I mean, it goes on for, a lo you know, just a huge area that all these roses are cultivated. And when you go there and it's in season, I'm telling you, you, you can't believe it. They, they are astounding. I mean, the colors, I mean, after all, I mean, the place, it rains like 24 seven for like nine months about. <laughs> But it's a great environment for producing these flowers and they are spectacular. So when I came to the city of Portland, this woman in our church, her name was Dolores Preble. Dolores, she loved roses and she came to my house and she brought me two rose bushes. And uh, she went in my backyard and planted them for me in the right spot and she fed them. And then she said, look, after this season, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna give you a, a lesson on what it means to prune. And sure enough, right around February, end of February, she came. And over here, right, we got like, you know, 
15,000 feet of snow. But over there in Oregon, man, it's still, it's, the daffodils are starting to come up out of the ground in the uh, end of February. So she came in and she says, look, every year you have to come and you have to remove any diseased, dead, or damaged limbs. And you have to cut it near a healthy bud. She says, when you cut, I want you to look at the inside of the stem because it should be white. If it's gray or it's black, she says, I want you to cut that limb off. And you have to cut this, this rosebush back until it's only about a third of its size. And then she says, and then cutting back to about the third of its woody stem so that you begin to kind of um, uh, shape it so it's like a little crown. Well, by the time she finished, I looked at this beautiful rosebush that had been there and it went, seriously, it went from the floor to about up here to about that big of a bush. I, I thought, this lady's insane, man. She just killed my rose bushes. <laughs> and, then, and then she would come back, and um, during that season, she said, look, what you need to do now is you get to cut off all these little dead blooms, right? You look for a five-leaf, you know, segment, and then you cut on a 45-degree angle. And I'm thinking, really? Like, that precise? Five leaves, little cuts on, a, on an angle? But the lady knew what she was doing. And Paul Parent, he agreed with her. And the next thing you know, man, that bush, man, it produced like flowers like you wouldn't believe. And it was like a visual like illustration of what it means to be pruned. It multiplies. For every pruning, man, it, it seemed like it just multiplied the branches. And the next thing you know, that thing was huge again with all kinds of beautiful flowers. And if it was left on its own, it would never have produced the quality of blooms that the pruning allowed. So now, we're not talking about just flowers here, are we? We're talking about people. Do you realize that when it says the Father is the is the, is the vine dresser. He is the one who does this pruning. Well, first of all, it's not fun to be pruned. Let's just be honest. Nobody likes the fact that God comes into a person's life and decides, hey, that stays, that doesn't stay. Or this is not good and we're gonna make some arrangements now to, to, to thin this out. Anybody likes that job? Nobody likes that job that God does in a person's life. In, times, in fact, sometimes it's downright confusing. But you know how God often prunes? We know the effects of those pruning. But notice what it says here. I want you to look at, look at that passage, and I want you to do me a favor. I want you to circle a couple of words. In verse 2, there is the word cut, right? It says, he cuts off every branch. Look at the, towards the end of that text, and it says, he prunes. I want you to circle prunes. And then in verse 3, Jesus makes a, a kind of a comment that doesn't seem to fit in the context of pruning and production here, but he says, you are already clean. I want you to circle the word clean. And he says, you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. The reason why I had you circle cut and prune and clean is because they all find in its root the same Hebrew word, I mean the same Greek word. They all have to deal with this idea of taking off, lifting off, pruning, cleaning. And so it's the same word, the same metaphor is being used throughout. And what Jesus is saying here is that the word of God has this pruning effect on a person's life. And I do understand that at the time, it hurts when he removes something that we consider to be precious. But the spiritual crop that is produced, it says, is going to prove that the Father knows what he's doing. Now, come on, we know what that's like, right? Nobody, nobody likes that process. So let me, let me give you a little personal examples here, right? First of all, this pruning process is meant so that we might be more productive, that we might bear more spiritual fruit. If the life of the branch is coming from the vine, if there's something wrong with the branch, it needs to be pruned. Those who are dead, they're, they're just going to be removed, but the other ones that remain, they still have to go through pruning, and that's going to be an ongoing process. So I have this conversation with one of my sons. 
He had uh, this place that he was going to live. He's up in uh, Aspen, Colorado, very expensive place. So he had this all worked out where he was going to be living and everything. And now all of a sudden he calls me late last night and says that this thing fell through and that he's been hitting a brick wall trying to find another place to live and blah, blah, blah. And so I'm talking to him and I'm, I'm being empathetic, right? I'm like, well, this is serious. Like, you know, what are you going to do? How you gonna, what's your plan B? Like, how, how are you going to go about it? And I'm trying to coax him through what his next steps are going to be. And then I said to him, I said, you know, my experience is that sometimes you could be pressing something and it doesn't seem like it's giving. And it could be that maybe God is not answering this call because he's using that as a way of resetting your direction. And maybe some of these other decisions that have been put on hold might need to be kind of fleshed out because if this isn't working, you could sit there and moan and groan all you want, but maybe God's way of pruning that opportunity is going to bring bloom in another one. Thanks for that, Dad. <laughs> right? I mean, it's hard, but, but that's the truth. That's the truth. And somewhere along the line, you, you're trying to live this life with this sense of understanding that God is working for me, not against me. And while it is painful, and I trust me, I, I, I've been in ministry now 33 years, and I do I hear tons of stories from people and sometimes they just break my heart and I just wish that I had the, po the, the power of one of those apostles that could remove the situation, you know, or, or make it all better in an instant. But somehow in the providence of God, he allows people to experience certain things, but he never does it to just cut you off. He always does it to prune us so that we might be more productive. And at the moment, bam, we feel the sting of that pruning, but we really sometimes not enough time hasn't passed until all of a sudden we can see the harvest that will come from that. I'll give you another one. And I'll use that, the next one here, just in uh, my own marriage. I'm gonna speak really boldly because my wife's not here this morning. <laughs> So I can say whatever I feel like it because I am not intimidated by her. <laughs> now, I'm sure you can imagine how I could use some pruning. And if you've met my wife, she's really sweet and everything. She probably doesn't need very much pruning. But every once in a while, she needs a little bit of pruning. And when those moments kind of surface, I could catch the attitude that, yo, sweetheart, you know, you need some pruning. But the last time I looked in the text, it says that God the Father was the one that was going to do the pruning, not me. I offered to do the job, but he never quite gave it to me yet. <laughs> but I sit there and I think, okay, now I have an option. If the Word of God, as Jesus says, the Word has cleansed you, it has pruned you, then the Word of God on my life is also doing something as the Word of God ought to be doing it hers. And like maybe I got pruned first before she did, but the point of the matter is, how am I going to react to her? So she's bugging me. I'm waiting for those few limbs, man, to get chopped off. <laughs> but it's not an excuse for me to, to all of a sudden turn around and and I'll, I'll tell you this, like, the Bible's pretty clear. It says this, it says, if a man doesn't treat his wife in an understanding way, his prayers are hindered. Dang, man, I don't like that verse. <laughs> Seriously, I could do 100% all the way out here, but if I'm, if I'm just messing up over here towards her, God says my prayers are hindered. What's up with that? And, and I, can't, I can't repay evil for evil because he says that's not, that's not an option either. So see what I'm saying to you is like sometimes the pruning process isn't on only on the person who's being pruned, but it's on the other person too. And it's not fun. But here's the thing, it's in those moments that you begin to recognize 
Who am I really submitting myself to? Is it my will or is it the Father's will? If the Father is the will who is perfect, who, who's demonstrating a love for us that goes beyond our abilities to procure for ourselves, then somehow or another, I need to find a way to get more and more in step with Him. And every time that happens, it's like, here's my life, and then here's the mirror of God's word, and now he's saying to me, okay, what are you going to do? And you recognize that if the branch derives its life from the vine, then the God, God the Father is the one who's in the business of pruning, and he does it for our good. So let me... Let me go on with this example here. Look at verse five. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Why? Because you're a branch and the life of the branch comes from the vine. So if I detach myself from the vine, it's like an appliance that sits on your counter but is no good until it's plugged into a power source. So this vine is the one that is providing all of the power, all of the life. So apart from him, I can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, burned. But if you remain in me, and notice my words remain in you because the word of God, it has this pruning effect on us. If the word of God remains in you, then ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Why? Because now my requests are going to be more and more in tune with the Father's request. And as a result, what I ask is going to be part of this Father's will. And it has his attention. So you know what this is saying to you and me? The second truth about the relationship between a branch and a vine is that the vine produces its fruit through the branch. It's a pretty obvious truth, but it's still, it's, it's worth noting. It, the branch itself, the fruit that appears on the branch, it's because the vine's life is flowing through that branch and the vine is producing its fruit through the branch. So what does that teach us? Well, listen up. It says here that the branch, right, this, this branch that we, that we see, it, 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 it's created. This, this branch here is now created for what? It's, it's created for us to demonstrate that, that the, um, the branch has the capacity to bring forth fruit. And, and so as a result of that, we find that the, uh, the second thing is also true about this, and that is this, that the fruitfulness of this branch that we, uh, that we see here is that it, it, the fruitfulness is because it is abiding in the vine. So the the fruitfulness is always determined about the way in which this abiding union is being demonstrated. And notice here in verse eight, it says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciple. So fruitfulness then is also true that it gives God glory. Now if Jesus is saying that that the, that the fruit bearing gives God glory, you're gonna bear much fruit, you show yourself to be my disciples, it's the same way in which Jesus did that for the Father. Jesus was always about doing the Father's will, not his own. He says, I have come to complete his task, to do the will of him who sent me. Let me, let me break this down even a little bit further for you. When you look at this text, I want you to now think in the back of your mind when Jesus said in other places, you are the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work and glorify your father who is in heaven. So notice it's you are the light of the world. This light of God is now working in you. And it says, so you're the light of the world. Let your good works so shine. Whose good works? Your good work. Let it so shine that it may what? Give glory to you or give glory to the Father? It gives glory to the Father. 
So the good work that you do as being part of this light of the world, the light of Jesus now in you begins to manifest itself in the good deeds that you perform and those good deeds give God glory. In the same way that Jesus, when he came, he did the works of the Father and all those works brought back praise for what God was doing in and through him. And so if the vine is going to produce fruit through its branches, it does so because the branches were created for it. It does it because it's in union with the vine and the end result is that God gets glory. Okay, so we understand the connection now between the branch and the vine and fruitfulness, but that's not enough because It's not enough just to say the branch derives life from the vine or that the vine produces its fruit through the branch. Because we have the question that's still before us, how are we to manifest then that kind of union with Jesus? So what is this life then that the branch is supposed to be experiencing? And though if you look at John 9 to verse 16, he gives you a little bit now of an answer because now he begins to apply this metaphor into our life. So he says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. You notice the connection between the Father and the Son now is being manifested in the work that the, fun, that the Son is doing. And he says, as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. So he says, now remain in my love if you obey my commands. And you remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. So now this word has to find a place in your life that begins to be directive. I am ordering my life now less by my own will and more by his. And the more I understand something of the will of God, then I treat people differently. I look at people differently. I demonstrate a little bit more of a patience because this life that you and I are experiencing is gonna place us in a position to understand something of the deep love of God. Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus says, hey, I have obeyed the Father and and I have done what the Father wanted. And he said, and so what has happened? This love of God has been made manifest in me. It has been completed in me. I I don't know how how to explain it, really. But, But listen to me for a moment. If you, if you had, let's say a bad nasal infection, or pneumonia, bronchitis, that made it difficult for you to breathe. Right now, you're sitting here and you're breathing in and out, you're not even thinking about twice about it. But let your breathing become a little impaired because of some sickness or disease, right? And then all of a sudden, every breath you take, you are consciously aware of the breath you're taking and hoping that your breathing would get a little easier. Why is that? Because suddenly now you've been aware that there's something that's been impeding you from taking this deep breath. And when that pneumonia gets cleared up or that bronchitis responds to medicine and now your breathing is less labored, boy, you, you, you find yourself appreciating taking a deep breath again, right? The promise here is that the life that the branch derives from the vine is going to have that effect in you of that deep-seated love of God that seems to fill your heart and your mind. I don't know how better to explain it other than I'm giving free reign to God to come into my life and fill me with his thoughts and his will. You know what else it says in here? It says, It goes on to say in verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. There is something about this fullness of joy that now is completed in a person's life. In in the second Peter, it says, the work of salvation on our behalf has produced in us an inexpressible and glorious joy. 
The joy of God now visited in a person's life because of what God through his son is doing in you. Joy, inexpressible, full of glory. That's what's in you. The only problem is now you have to tell your face that. Because your face hasn't caught up with this inexpressible and glorious joy yet. How is it that a person could walk around being the, 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 um, the person now who has been filled with this inexpressible and glorious joy and we look around like we're the most miserable people on the planet? Your face never really catches up and people around you, they have no idea that inside that person there is this overwhelming sense of joy. Really? I'm not so sure. You got to put a smile on your face. Honestly, think about this now. This joy has been made complete because of the work of God in your life. I'm attached to this vine. If it is very difficult for you to somehow or another pick up on that, then you need to pray a little bit more about how you are being attached to the vine because if I'm going to manifest this union with Jesus and this, this life now that I as a living branch is, is receiving from this, it, it's saying it ought to show itself in a deep love for God and, and it ought to show itself in a, in a joy that is complete. And maybe the pruning process is still going on because I am not weaned away from the things of the world so that they aggravate me so much that I never really get a chance to really enjoy this relationship with Jesus. And that's not what he wants because the branch was made to be fruitful. This is the life that we should be having. Anything less than that is less than what God designed. Are we all there? Somebody smile. Yeah, that's better. So if that's the life then that the branch is supposed to experience, then what is the fruit that it's supposed to produce? Well, you see, the fruit that it produces, when you look at this text again, right? When you look at the text again, what you discover, it says, that the fruit that the branch will display. Look at verse 12, it says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants. I, because he says a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. The implication there is that Jesus is laying down his life for his friends, and he has been fully disclosing as to what the will of the Father is, so that they're not in the dark. You and I are not in the dark. The Spirit of God now resides in us. It it illumines our minds so we understand something of the ways of God. So the fruit that the branch ought to display is the same kind of fruit that Jesus has been displaying in his ministry. And what is that? But a sacrificial kind of love. Jesus did lay down his life for his friends. And you know what? He even went one step further. In the, in the book of Romans, chapter 5, it says, God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What does that say about grace? What does that say about being patient towards one another? Is your life marked out by that? Is the fruit that your life produces, is it more about you or is it more about putting others ahead of yourself? And you could have every reason in the world why you are the way you are, but at the end of the day, the fruit that you are to be producing as a believer attached to the vine is one that is experiencing something personal here of the deep love of God and of a joy complete. Why? Because I am at one with the one who created me. And now that gets manifested in the world by showing the world that same sense of love because what's on the inside gets to be spilled out. And the other thing is, notice this here in 16, it says, you didn't choose me, I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. What's a fruit that will last? A fruit that lasts 
Reminds me of when Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves can break in and steal. See, there's something about treasure that is stored up in this world that makes it very vulnerable. Jesus says, rather, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither rust nor moth can destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. So now, instead of putting all my treasure in this world, now it's saying, I have to, I have to put, make sure that I am investing in heaven. And how do you do that? But he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And the last time I looked, the only things that get into heaven are people. Stuff is not getting into heaven. Material things are not going into heaven. It's the investment that you make in your spouse, in your family, in your friends, in your coworkers, in your community, as you engage the world around you as a light that shines the love of God out. That is what's changing the world. And that is what is reserved in heaven. So why am I working so hard for stuff that's not going to last? Jesus says my life ought to prove it to be a generous life, a life that always has something to give. Does that mark out you? We're Christians attached to the vine. My life ought to be showing a deep love of God and a joy that is not based on circumstances. And the fruit that my life produces, it ought to be seen in the outpouring of that, which shows itself to be a generous spirit, a sacrificial one. Because the fruit of the Spirit of God in you is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, kindness, self-control. Do you have self-control in your life? Then it's because you're attached to the vine. You see a growing sense of patience in your life? Don't get all happy. It's because you've been attached to the vine. You're starting to show more a, a, a kindness and a faithfulness. Seriously, for the miserables among us, the joy that all of a sudden spontaneously appears on your face, that's because you're attached to the vine. The most natural thing for the branch to do is to produce the fruit of the vine. How powerful is that? How life transforming is that? It'll change the way you parent. It'll change the way you love your spouse. It'll change the way we do church. You can't just be hanging on and be minimally attached because you'll never be productive. But if you are attached to that vine, God is making a promise to fill your heart with his love and to fill your soul with a joy that will take you from this life into the one to come. Amen? Amen. Now put a smile on your face. Awesome. Awesome. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for passages just like this that we have seen now in the true vine One who promises, Lord, to give us all that we need for life and godliness. Your words, they become our instructors. Your spirit provides the the power that is needed. May we continue to practice the spiritual discipline of abiding of leaning into you, of studying your word so that our responses to the world around us would be different. So that internally, Lord, sometimes this churning that takes place could be replaced, Lord, by a peace that passes all understanding, by a peace that is a result of your spirit standing guard over our hearts and our minds. Lord, in this world, there is a lot of trouble. 
but in you there is victory. May we just claim that. And we'll be careful again, Lord, to give you all the praise in Christ's name. Amen.